Welcome to our discussion about the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862. I'm Mike Edgerly of Minnesota Public Radio News. A lot has been written and said about the war this year, the 150th anniversary of the fighting and the eventual expulsion of the Dakota people from their homeland here in Minnesota. Our discussion today follows up on two key parts of the discussion that have taken place in the last few months. Recently, Minnesota Public Radio News broadcast Little War on the Prairie, produced by one of our panelists today. The program was an adaptation that was broadcast nationally on This American Life the Saturday after Thanksgiving. If you did not hear it, that documentary, Little War on the Prairie, resides online at mprnews.org. For the next hour, we want to discuss the war with an emphasis on education. What should Minnesota students know about the fighting and its aftermath, and how should teachers teach that story? You're invited to join the discussion online by entering your comments in the area just below this video. And the members of our panel will do their best to answer those questions. Joining us by telephone is John Bewin. John is the reporter and producer of Little War on the Prairie, the documentary. John is a former NPR News reporter and a native of Mankato, Minnesota. John, he is, uh, today John is the audio program director at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. John, thanks for taking time to join us from your perch at Duke. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Also on our panel is Minneapolis Star Tribune reporter Kurt Brown. Kurt wrote the series and the ebook In the Footsteps of Little Crow, 150 years after the U.S. Dakota War. Kurt, thanks for crossing the river and coming to Minnesota Public Radio. It's an honor to be here. Thanks, Mike. Also on the panel is Kate Bean. Kate is Flandreau Santee, Dakota, and a Ph.D. candidate in American Studies at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She's a graduate instructor at the U and serves as an adjunct faculty member teaching Dakota culture and history at Minneapolis Community and Technical College. Uh, Kate is a contributor to the recent book, Minnesota Makoche, in which she wrote a piece in, that, uh, in the book that focused on a village led by her great-grandfather, Cloud Man. That village, by the way, was located at the lake we know as Calhoun. Its original name in Dakota was Bade Makeska. And forgive me, Kate, if I completely and utterly ruined that. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Will you say the name of that uh, of that village on Lake Calhoun and it's well, the village was called Heato Tumwe, mm -hmm. the village to the side um, and the lake itself was called Bere Makaska uh, White Banks Lake and we, st we still call it that today. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Kate we're going to start with you as a Dakota. How did you learn about the War of 1862 and the expulsion? Uh, did you hear about this in school or did your family talk about it? How did you learn about it? No um, you know, it's it's hard to really gauge exactly when I first started hearing about it. Um, I know I, as an adult, I started hearing about it from my, my father and from my uncle William Bean in Flandreau. Um, and um, it wasn't anything I was taught about in school, and that was part of the problem um, that I had with the fact that I, you know, it took me uh, a long time to, to learn about the, to learn this information and to, to figure out where to go to find this type of information. It wasn't actually until I moved to Minnesota as an adult um, that I that I really learned about a lot of this stuff. Mm. And uh, I'd like to ask, what what did you do? You recall what you thought when you first heard about the fighting, and then later the forced expulsion of your peoples. I remember um, feeling like all of a sudden things made sense. Um, the feelings that I had growing up, feeling displaced, um, feeling sad. Um, wondering what had happened. You know, I, I, I feel like I, I grew up with these big questions and um, learning about this time period and learning what happened to my people taught me where those emotions came from. Mm -hmm. um, it taught me who I was and, and it taught me that I came from strength. Um, and it taught me a lot about who I was as a person. Um, and it, you know, it, it gave me gave me the strength to, to delve deeper into the story and find out, you know, what exactly happened, not only what happened, but why did it happen? Mm -hmm. You know, what's our relationship to this land? Why is it that I didn't grow up in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. What brought me back here? Why was it that I struggled and, and searched for a long time for a home? And, and when I came to Minnesota and stood on the banks of, of Lake Calhoun, why did I suddenly, 
feel like I belonged. Mm. You know, it, it took a long time to get there. And your ancestors were among those people expelled. Yeah, my my, I, you know, I come from I come from a family in exile. I still feel like I'm a person in exile. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of Dakota people um, are still living in exile today, um, and it's a, it's a struggle, and and it's it's one of those things where. Um, we just, you know, we, we want to come home and, and we, we still have this strong attachment and relationship to this place um, that comes from the fact that this, this place was where we were created. Um, we are the caretakers of this land and we have a strong bind, a strong tie to the land mm -hmm. um, that, that brings us back here. I think the land kind of calls us back. John, you grew up in Mankato. You had a decent education and as we heard in your documentary, Little House, A Little War on the Prairie, you only learned about uh, the event, the war, as we're calling it, and the expulsion of the Dakota people later. What's your take on how well Minnesota has handled this chapter in state history? Well, I, you know, like, like um, Kate, it's, it's a little hard to, I, I, I don't claim that I never, ever heard of it at all while I was in Mankato, but I didn't, uh, what I do, I, I do say is that I didn't hear about it in school, and I don't remember it coming up once in sort of regular conversation, um, uh, and, I, and I, at some point I heard about it, but I think I was pretty typical in the sense that there was this factoid that I was aware of, that this hanging had taken place, and there was something about a Sioux uprising, and it all seemed like a million years ago, and I didn't know um, I certainly didn't know uh, what led up to those events or the aftermath. And in fact, I, I, I can honestly say that that even though I had paid some attention later, for example, um, you know, there was a very fine uh, Twin Cities Public Television uh, documentary done in the 90s, I believe it was, early or mid 90s. I, I saw that, um, and I had and I had uh, gradually absorbed. Uh, some more important parts of the story, like the fact that the treaties had been broken, that uh, the Dakota people were in desperate situation in the summer of 1862. Um, but I still hadn't really gotten a lot of the details uh, that I, um, so much of what I learned that, that's in the documentary, I just learned in the past year while researching it, like really how that whole treaty process went um, and, and uh, the role of people like Henry Sibley in that mm -hmm. process. And the, the, another huge fa uh, part of it for me was the expulsion and the, the, the severe punishment of all the Dakota people after the War of 18, 1862. That really hadn't sunk in um, the, 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 the dramatic events, that piece of it, until really just very recently. Right. Um, how, do we, how are we handling it? I mean, I think, I think there's gradual change. I like to think that this 150th anniversary mm -hmm. year and the fairly significant attention that the events have gotten um, may begin to move us toward a critical mass where we're ready to talk about this more fully in our education system, but I think we've got a long way to go. Kurt, uh, your reporting, your multi-part series and your ebook certainly is a big part of this conversation, the, the evolving knowledge of something that was originally taught, probably, if it was taught at all, as the Sioux Uprising. Um, how did you uh, how did you first learn about this piece of Minnesota history and what com uh, two parts and how did you come to learn about this war and what compelled you to write the piece which really turned on the the leader of the Dakota people at that time Little Crow well we decided about a year ago Mike that we knew this anniversary was coming up and we wanted to do kind of a major project and and, and we decided to focus that on Little Crow because we thought. It's such a complex thing, especially when you look at all the factors that led to the war. It wasn't just a war that broke out. There were there were years and, and centuries, really, that led up to the war. And, and to set the stage, it, it's a complex history. And, and we thought if we could try to tell the story through one man's life, and that being Little Crow, that people might be able to get their arms around it. So that's, I mean, it's one one reason, reason we went at it. And when you look at Little Crow's life, here was a a leader who was born between 1810 and 1818, no one's exactly sure where, at, at Kaposha, which was, is only seven miles away from Fort Snelling, which was built in 1820. So the two grew up together, literally. So when this clash came, it only follows that Little Crow would get caught up in it. So we, 
By focusing on him, we tried to tell the whole story of what led to the war, the 150 years that followed through one man's life. And the other thing that helps in Little Crow's life, he was photographed. He was There's pictures of Little Crow. His speeches are recalled by his son and have been carried down. So he's not just an abstract historical figure. You can look at pictures of him because photography was just developing. We went out to Flandreau and met some of his uh, descendants who read his speech that we included on our website online. So... You know, in some ways, 150 years, like John mentioned, seems like a million years ago. But then when you start talking to descendants on both the settler and the Dakota side, it's really uh, just, a, a historically speaking, kind of a blink of the eye. Right. It's, um, it, it struck me in your, in your reporting that Little Crow is, um, is his story, um, as removed as it might be from my culture, white culture, it's a very familiar culture. A familiar story, a, a young man with promise who's, whose mother clearly wants, des, saw him as destined for leadership, sort of went off on his own, was maybe um, a, a less of a leadership material early on, but then later had leadership thrust upon him and then became not just a person of action, but a, but a thinker and a philosopher. There were some real poignant scenes when you look at his life, and one of them was, you know, he made two trips to Washington and met with two presidents, was in the White House twice, and watched, he watched the Washington Monument getting constructed. So yeah. this wasn't a man just living and, you know, hunting uh, buffalo out on the plains. This was a guy who had seen America and seen kind of the white man invading and really taking over the country. And there was one scene when he went in a gallery in Washington and the reporters, my predecessors, followed him into this art gallery. And there was a big mural on the wall of Western scenes, the Wild West, I think it was called. And there was actually a scene of Kaposha, his village. And mm-hmm. at first he kind of lit up, according to the reporters, and smiled about it. And you could find the clip in the old Washington newspapers. Then he saw a burial scaffolding scene was depicted in this painting, and he grew very upset and walked out because he realized he had just signed a treaty or was forced to sign a treaty, you can argue, that gave that land away, that gave his home village away to the to the white settlers who were pouring into Minnesota when it was just a four-year-old state. Mm-hmm. Kate, uh, how did you how did you learn about Little Crow? Um, to be honest, I think I probably learned about Little Crow. Well, it went through my my uncle William, who's who's kind of our our family historian, but also um, through um, my undergraduate work at the University of Minnesota um, in the Department of American Indian Studies. Um, that's when I really started looking into Dakota history. I took I took a part in the Dakota lo- language program. Um, I participated in that program. I'm, gra- I'm a graduate of that program. Um, and while learning relearning my language, I also really started looking into my history. Um, and that's when I when I really found out about Little Crow and, mm-hmm. and, and about what happened. What does he mean to your people? Um, you know, I think he's he's one of the many heroes that we have. You know, um, I, he's a controversial figure at the same time. Um, and I think that, you know, um, as a Dakota person, our our heroes don't often get um, talked about or, you know, we don't learn about them. You know, in schools, we, we get President's Day. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I used to work as a Dakota language immersion preschool teacher in Minneapolis. And in the program that I worked at, um, we actually, instead, we had... Um, we had Chief's Day, <laughs> and we would educate the kids about Chief Little Crow and Chief Wabasha mm-hmm. and, and the number of the chiefs that, that, that um, and the leaders that we have in our communities. Um, what do you think, if you had to establish a curriculum right now, what, what would, how would, how would Little Crow play in the history of uh, of Minnesota? What would you say to educators listening and reading this that they should say about Little Crow to their students? Um, Well, I think that his story is an important story to tell, you know, Um, and I think it's important to talk about his life. I think it's important to talk about his father. I think it's important to talk about where he came from. Um, It's important to talk about why he made the decisions that he made, uh, where those decisions came from. Um, It's also important to, you know, to talk about how um, not everyone agreed with those decisions, um, and and um, and and talk, also talk about what happened to him. You know, um, I think sometimes we just 
cast off these figures as if they disappeared and 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 his his story is a very important story to Minnesota and just like uh, like I said before a number of our leaders stories aren't told in our schools mm -hmm. and these are these are very <coughs> important people to our community um, and their life stories deserve to be told and and some of the even some of the atrocities that happened during their lives including what happened to Little Crow later on mm -hmm. with the Minnesota History Center and yes. and and with um, what happened with his body and and um, what happened, um, you know, re repatriating his remains to Flandreau, we need to, we need to learn about those things. Growing up, I remember going to the Flandreau um, cemetery and, and visiting his grave, but as a child, I didn't know, I didn't really know who he was, but I would always, my sisters and I, we would visit his grave and leave candy, and <laughs> we knew he was an important person, but mm -hmm. we didn't know why. Right. We're uh, talking today about the, uh, the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862 and the eventual forced expulsion of the Dakota people from, uh, from Minnesota. Our guests uh, in, on this panel are Kate Bean. She's Flandreau Santee, Dakota. She's a PhD candidate in American Studies at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Kurt Brown is here. He's a reporter with the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Uh, he wrote um, a series of articles and an e-book called Little Crow, 150 Years After the U.S.-Dakota War. And John Bewin has joined us uh, by telephone. He's the reporter and producer of Little War on the Prairie, a documentary uh, that recently aired, and it is right now on the nprnews.org website. In our live chat, Dana says, in my district, that's the Forest Lake area north of the Twin Cities, they've started to use Kurt Brown's articles, but mostly so teachers themselves can learn our history. In turn, they are then more able to teach the children. That's a pretty interesting uh, comment, it seems, that uh, we're discussing what educators should say to students, but actually the teachers themselves may not be versed in this history, which really uh, seems to argue for um, uh, a change in higher education curriculum that, w that is preparing teachers to go out and teach kids. Wouldn't you think, John? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, one of the things that's been most gratifying for me in the response to, uh, to Little War on the Prairie, uh, in the comments, for instance, on, on This American Life's Facebook page, there were dozens and dozens of comments. And, and one of the most common kinds of comments was that, you know, this, this documentary ought to be, ought to be uh, uh, required listening for every middle schooler or for every high schooler. Uh, not just in Minnesota, but but in the country, the comments like that, and that, that certainly the same thing is true of Kurt's series and some of the other good work that's been done this year. Um, I, I do think that uh, I do think that uh, oftentimes teachers, uh, you know, because of some of the things that we that we've been talking about, that people didn't uh, who, who grew up in Minnesota, and certainly if they didn't grow up in Minnesota, they they they're very unlikely to have heard this history. Uh, and so it, there, it depends on the kind of the materials they're working with. Um, I think there's a pretty respectable presentation of the story uh, in the sixth grade um, Minnesota history textbook that's now standard in Minnesota. Um, but clearly, with a, you know, there was the example of the third grade teacher in, in Mankato who, uh, <laughs> uh, shall we say, um, you know, whatever she had absorbed uh, uh, was not terribly helpful in, in how she was going to present it to her kids. Uh, so, yeah, I do think that um, that uh, educating the teachers is a, is a great place to start. I should point out, Mike, too, because I spent one afternoon kind of going through the Minnesota educational standards, and there's a matrix online, and it's kind of confusing. But there's one sentence in there that says, every Minnesota sixth grader is expected to be able to compare and contrast the Dakota and settler experiences of this 1862 war. And mm -hmm. sometimes I wonder if sixth grade's the right year for that. I guess that's when you get Minnesota history. But right. it's a complex stuff for, you know, adults to sift through this stuff. Right. For sixth graders, it almost seems a little young. I, I tend to agree. I think that's right, though, is that, <clears throat> that state history, uh, the state history is taught in sixth grade. Um, and, and I think I wonder then too, and, and, and the teachers in Mankato explained to me that the standard would be, it would be a, a unit of about one week. And so I can imagine that, that in, if you don't have a, particularly if you don't have a dynamic teacher who manages to bring this story to life, um, that, uh, that a lot of sixth graders could, 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 could get that exposure. And by the time they're a senior, they, you know, they may, 
forgotten it even happened. You know, it's, it's, it's another. I love to say to people that I think that uh, that uh, for those for for those who did manage to hear about it in school, who were anywhere close to my vintage, um, and and a lot di- uh, didn't, and and some you know some of the people I talked to say they re- did recall hearing something about it. With that, it ends up being this kind of factoid that's sort of like uh, something happened to Napoleon at Waterloo. <laughs> no, it's just, it, and I think that's the larger point that I tried to make um, with the documentary. It was not not so much um, even just how it's taught in school, but 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 how it hasn't kind of permeated the larger uh, culture and the day to day culture of the way Minnesotans. You know, Minnesotans have a pretty strong sense of. Uh, and I'm talking about white Minnesotans now. Forgive me for just a moment, Kate. Um, uh, that we have this pretty strong sense of of the, our place and of uh, uh, of the heritage of of, uh, of of our people, and uh, but that it's often has enormous holes in it, uh, things that have been left out. And that's a bit a different conversation. Is how do you get this history into the general consciousness and the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Right. Kate, please. I think it's important to incorporate it um, into all of our curriculum, not just history. You know, we have some great writers out there. Charles Eastman, you know, is, you know, his writing, his, his book, Indian Boyhood, is a great piece of literature from a Minnesota born author who um, was exiled, um, who tells a part of our story. And I don't, I mean, I, I would, in a sense, have to disagree. I, I don't think sixth grade is too soon to learn about these things because they are harsh realities and it is the world we live in and it, and it is, you know, something that we have to to learn how to um, to understand um, and, and to think critically about. And it's important to, to plant that seed early on. Um, I think it's important to have consistency and to continue to talk about these things. You know, I teach at both Minneapolis Community and Technical College and at the University of Minnesota. And when I ask my students at the University of Minnesota, you know, I get a number of students that are from small town or suburb, suburban Minnesota and Wisconsin. And, and I ask them uh, in from all over, but um, a, a large number of students from Minnesota. And when I ask them um, if they have heard about the Dakota War, and I also ask them what they know about Dakota people, because it's important to, to not just teach about the war, but also to teach about us as a people and to teach our, our longer history. Um, and when I ask them what they know, I maybe get one hand raised in a class of 25, 30 students. Um, and, you know, and may, so maybe things are changing. I've been told that there's, there's more, um, that there's more in our curriculum now um, at the middle school and, 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 and a high school level. But, you know, historically there, there really has been very little because I'm seeing the students that receive nothing. Um, and, and I'm the first one to give them this information. Mm-hmm. And they are horrified. They are actually become very angry and they come up to me after class and they want to spend two hours talking mm-hmm. about why is it that the educational system failed me? Mm-hmm. Why do I not know about the true history of this place? You know, I, I require all of my students to, to do an assignment where they tell me about the indigenous people of the community where they grew up. Um, and so many students can't find those people. And that's part of the assignment. You know, I tell them, you know, well, isn't that a problem that you can't find the people of where you come yeah, from, who right. was there first, right. you know? And it, 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 it seems to me that as someone who did not grow up in Minnesota, this is fascinating history. You know, take, take the opinions and, the, and sort of the politics of the matter out. It's just a story worth knowing about where you live. And if you're only getting part of the story, then you don't really know your place. It's like knowing what a, what a, a maple tree is, but not knowing what a pine tree is. Mm-hmm. How can you live in a place where you don't know the full story? Uh, Kurt, I'll get to you in just okay. a second, but I want to note some of the comments we're getting uh, from our live uh, chat. Um, I'm, this is from Dana. Uh, I'm so grateful that the Minnesota Department of Education now finally has Minnesota Native American standards in place. Uh, language arts, music, science, and now social studies. Uh, Dana agrees that teachers need to read and study more about Native history, history in order to teach better. Also, Matthew says, uh, in regard to when these topics are taught, we look at it in seventh and eighth grade as well and compare contrast with the U.S. Civil War. That's pretty, uh, that seems like a pretty significant uh, achievement there. And Jason says, the question of analyzing 
and comparing the Civil War and the Dakota War of 1862 are really high-level thinking questions, and it is sometimes even difficult to get this type of thinking with 7th and 8th graders. You know, the point I wanted to make, Kurt. Mike, is that, and it's a good way for people, I think, to access this complex story we're talking about, is just taking Abraham Lincoln's role in what happened in Minnesota in 1862. You know, you can talk to um, the general public, I think, will say, Abraham Lincoln's a hero. Now there's a big Steven Spielberg movie that's great, and I recommend it to everybody. But, you know, he's the the, the man who freed the slaves, the, the great emancipator Abraham Lincoln. I've talked to a lot of Dakota people in the research of my story who say, well, wait a minute, he, he hanged 38 of my great-great-grandfathers. He... Uh, you know, signed the death warrants for the largest mass execution in John's hometown of Mankato. You know, both those perspectives are accurate, and it just kind of shows you how history has so many different perspectives. And, and I think if you just take Lincoln's role in the War of 1862, that would be a good way for, you know, students, instead of just saying, oh, he's our hero, he's Abraham Lincoln, but to look at, you know, the full picture of what Lincoln did and, and some of the decisions he had to make and, you know, and and analyze that, and I think that's did, a, a good topic for kids. Uh, and, and anyone jump in here who knows the answer. Did Lincoln sign a document that allowed the expulsion of the Dakota people from Minnesota? Is that how that happened? It, it, Congress passed that, and he signed it, mm -hmm. yes. But, I mean, we should point out that Lincoln, and you can talk to other people who will point out, Minnesota wanted to hang 303 Dakota right. Uh, people who took part in this war. Lincoln said, wait a minute, and he had two of his lawyers go through these trial transcripts, which is a whole other topic you could write a book about. Some of these trials lasted for five minutes. They did 12 in a day. Mm -hmm. They hurried them through, and you know, nobody got to have a lawyer to represent them in these trials, but Lincoln did, you could argue, save 250-some lives when he, li he limited the list of the hang from 303 to 38. So some would argue that he saved lives. Some would argue that he that he, you know, led the largest mass execution in the country's history. Both are right, but it's history and perspective. And okay. at the same time, you know, how, you know, how were those lives saved? The men were still sent to prison. Um, you know, our, our people were still exiled. People still died, you know, and, 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 you know, I understand that, that argument um, in, in one context, but at the same time, 38 men plus two, you know, were hanged. Um, and we have to remember those souls and those spirits. And, and to us, you know, that's, that's the most important thing. It's not about numbers. Um, it's, it's, about, it's about justice and it's about, um, it's about lives and it's about a community of people and, and what happened to us, you know, and it's about truth. And I think that, you know, the, the um, one thing we talked about before, about 150 years ago, not being that long ago, um, it really, it really wasn't, you know, when I talk to my students about this time period, I'm talking about my grandmother's grandmother, um, mm -hmm. who fled on horseback, mm -hmm. you know, I know my grandmother, she's 101 <laughs> years old, she's the oldest living member of our tribe, um, I adore her, and this was her grandmother and mm -hmm. her grandfather that went through this experience and were exiled, so it's very close to home, um, and it's still very personal, and still very fresh, and it it's still happening right now because it's still something that we're, we're dealing with and trying to figure out how to live with. I'd like to uh, bring in a comment from Roxanne Gould, I believe that's right, uh, who writes in our, our chat. Um, I'm just giving a portion of this. Every teacher across the U.S. should be required to take and teach who the indigenous people are and the history of colonization. Uh, when when um, Roxanne worked in Iowa, she writes, we had these discussions as early as third grade. As students get older, more detail and truth can be included. By the time uh, the students come to her class, they are often angry, this sound familiar, Kate, that they have not been taught these things. Um, also, Michael writes, the Civil War is a center to most U.S. history courses at any grade level. In Minnesota, the Dakota conflict was central to what was going on during the Civil War. It would be absurd to exclude talking about it whenever the Civil War is the topic here in Minnesota. That's another part of the story, isn't it? Um, John, I'm thinking about you here. I mean, we can't view any of this without, I mean, I mean everything's connected, right? Um, the, 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 the U.S. Dakota War, the Civil War, I mean, all of this was a part of one large episode in U.S. history unfolding at the same time. Well, and, 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 and of, of the... Uh of the expansion of the of the country, that's really the story that 
we're talking about there. So um, absolutely, and there are all kinds of opportunities to talk about it. One encouraging moment um, that was in our documentary was the, the the senior tennis player. Oh, actually, this was in the uh, this American Life version, not the NPR version. But one of the girls that I talked to at Mankato West when I went back said that, oh, we hear about it every year in one way or another. <clears throat> and and uh, I was encouraged to hear that. And I do think that you could certainly, uh, you know, if there's a, a, a grade level higher up where they're talking not about specifically, you know, about state history, but they're talking about social studies and uh, there are all kinds of contemporary issues that involve uh, that involve Native Americans in Minnesota or whatever that you could easily um, take take the time to remind remind students about this about this history and how we got to where we are. Uh, even if you were going to talk about you know say the casinos and and uh, uh, and and how those are viewed today, uh, that there's that there's you can't talk about that really. You can't understand the, uh, even a story like that without talking about. Uh, how the Dakota came to be in the communities that they're in today and how this all happened so that there, I can Im imagine many, many ways of coming at it. Right. Well, and I'll paraphrase it from a Minnesota historian who said that the, the history, in the history of the country, the Civil War is a major event and the, and the Dakota War in Minnesota is kind of a minor event, but in Minnesota, those two things are flip-flopped. Mm -hmm. And yeah. really, the, in Minnesota, we should be studying the, the U.S.-Dakota War far more than the, what was raging down in the South. I think in any community you should be it should be required um at every level to teach that indig to teach about the indigenous peoples of that place. You know, I think that at the University of Minnesota, I think at every college campus it should be required in their in their curriculum that every student take a Dakota history course. Mm -hmm. Um and I say this because these are the people that are going to be going out teaching mm -hmm. <laughs> about these things and and you know, we really need to educate ourselves and the, you know, looking back at also that comment that was made on the on on, on John's piece from the the educator who made the comment um, in the third grade classroom that um, saying that Dakota, you know, talking about the the Dakota War and, and how Dakota yeah. people um, didn't know how to solve their conflicts and right. something right. about use your words, um, yeah. you know, and 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 it's just horrifying to think that that's still happening and. And it is still happening. And, it, and, it, and, and that, when I heard that piece, it took me back to middle school. It took me back to elementary school. It took me back to the type of things that I remember learning and hearing about Indian people. Um, and, and, you know, everybody needs to th think about this stuff, no matter what community you come from. You know, you need to te teach about the indigenous people of that place. And you need to, to become educated on those people in order to tell a more accurate story. Um, because what, you know, the, one of the things is, is, is I remember there was a, qu a comment ma made that maybe there wasn't a Dakota child there to, to defend themselves. And, and the fact is, is, well, two things, you know, number one, why, why do our children have to defend themselves in, mm -hmm. in, in schools, you know? And number two, what does it do to our, our children's identity? You know, um, the fact is we are members of these classrooms. You might not see us. Um, we, we are considered a v invisible people in, in, in this place, in this world, and, and, and oftentimes we get kind of overlooked, and uh, some of us don't necessarily look the stereotypical Indian, and you might not know that we're Dakota, but we are in that classroom, and when those teachers are making those types of comments, um, those, are that, th those types of experiences stay with our kids, and they do a lot of damage in our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that comment, by the way, <clears throat> Kate, was meant... Um, with a little bit of uh, wryness, um, it, 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 uh, I, yeah, and, and also there are a couple things I would say. One is that um, uh, it, that's not to minimize also the grave damage that's being done by that kind of talk, um, uh, regardless of whether there are uh, Dakota children in the room. Um, but also it was a segue to, to talking about the fact, uh, to talking about the subject of the expulsion of the Dakota from the state, so that there are um, far fewer Dakota in the state today than there 
otherwise would have been. But yeah. absolutely, yeah. I didn't mean to say that there are not Dakota around. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't mean to, <laughs> to imply that you did. I, I simply meant that it, it led me to thinking about those things, which is yeah, why, why right. one of the reasons I love that program is it, 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 you know, really brought on a lot of important topics and a lot of important thoughts. And yeah. uh, w one of the um, um, w what emerged from John's reporting for me, um, having familiarized with my story as a journalist the last few years, um, was. Uh, the 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 separation between what was a national policy of expulsion of indigenous peoples to make room for white settlement on the one hand versus uh, what was obviously based on the record uh, fairly underhanded dealings between Henry Sibley and the people that he had uh, developed strong relationships with uh, John I thought your your reporting was especially emphatic about the fact that um, apart from any political policy, this was a guy who basically ripped off um, the Dakota people in order to settle his own personal debts he had incurred. Am I over or understating that? No, I think I think that's right. And and you know he, if for sort of narrative purposes, he he was the one kind of character that we that we chose to kind of. Uh, Put forward and develop in that way, but he was obviously not alone. It was a, um, you know, there were a number of people, officials in Minnesota and in Washington, who were involved in in uh, making that happen. But that was something that was very striking to me when I really looked. If you read Mary Winkert's book, um, North Country, or or Gwen, or Gwen uh, Westerman's book uh, that we've talked about, that Kate had uh, had a part in. Minnesota Makoche. Uh, Gwen, for instance, I think was the first to kind of figure out uh, that um, that the uh, to sort of tra have translated the Dakota version of the of the Traverse de Sioux Treaty that was made for the Dakota chiefs at the time, and to and to notice and to realize that key parts of the of the treaty uh, were not in the Dakota language version. Um, so that there was, the, you know, come, uh, in, a, in a variety of ways, it was just they did not deal in a, in a straight way with, with the Dakota leaders. You know, I think one way, I think kids get the general idea of patriotism. I think they, they know that the Revolutionary War heroes were patriots defending their homeland. And I think you could argue with, you know, you could help educate kids and say, you know, weren't the Dakota the true patriots? This was their homeland for... 9,000 years they'd lived in Minnesota. People were coming and invading them, and weren't they patriotic? But that would make kids think, you know, wasn't the, weren't they the true Minnesota patriots defending their homeland? And just have them kick that around in their, whether it's sixth grade or older. Right. Uh, I, I would assume that, uh, and maybe some of the educators uh, taking part uh, in this discussion can help me out, um, not having been educated here. I would assume that, that uh, Henry Sibley and Alexander Ramsey's roles um, both on a personal level and as a political, uh, on a political level, are not discussed in the way that Kurt, you and John have reported, and that is that these were were politicians who had personal gain to make by the um, uh, extermination and expulsion of native peoples, and uh, that 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 was just not taught well, in and, Minnesota schools. And certainly a lot of people aren't familiar or don't realize that Sibley and a lot of these white early Minnesotans had taken Dakota wives and had children with Dakota women. They were trying to kind of infiltrate the kinship network. So, you know, Sibley, it's kind of ironic that Ramsey would exterminate the Dakota, you know, and kick them out and banish them forever from the state, which is still in the federal law. But these guys, before they kicked them out, they kind of said, well, lie down with me, you know, for a while. Let's make a few babies before I kick you out. So it's, I mean, it really gets at the hypocrisy that these leaders of our state, that counties and schools are named after their legacies. We have a comment from M. Black Elk who writes uh, in our chat, we need to give students more credit on, on dealing with controversial or depressing issues. When we encourage an environment in education, especially in social sciences, that tries to dilute the information, then you're not allowing students agency in their own educations. What do you think, Kate, as a I Dakota and educator? I think that's an excellent point. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we should, you know, um, devalue 
um, the ability of our kids to, to understand this information and to grasp it. And I think it's really important to teach from a very young age how to think critically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and whether, you know, we agree on things or not, it's very important to teach kids how to think for themselves and, and, and how to really, you know, be able to look at this ma material and, 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 and um, decide for themselves how do they feel, how does it make them feel, what do they think about it, you know. I think it's an important thing. Mm -hmm. John, uh, another poignant moment, I thought, an important moment in uh, Little War on the Prairie was where, uh, was when you introduced your audience to uh, the writing of Thomas Jefferson, who in effect spelled out very clearly what was um, the strategy of the United States, or it should be, in in basically tricking people or indebting, uh, making indebted native peoples so that um, the, the white settlers and their, their agents could basically take their land. Could you explain that a little bit more? Right, and, and what Jefferson said in a letter in 1803, and let's see, I don't have that in front of me, but I believe it was a letter to uh, an official in Indiana, um, Indiana Territory. And uh, he said, basically, uh, we will, uh, if I'm getting this exactly right, we shall push our trading houses to, to, you know, to get uh, Native people in debt. And this, I'm paraphrasing now. Um, <clears throat> because when people, uh, because when they get uh, in, into debt beyond what they can pay, then they are willing to lop, lop off those debts by giving up land, by the cession of land. Um, it was just a very stark statement. Um, that this is going to be a strategy for getting um, for getting lands that the, that the uh, uh, that the American Indian tribes aren't going to want to just hand over to us a surprise. Um, so yeah, it was a, it, it is a really I think eye opening, uh, and I'm sure to a lot of uh, to a lot of Native people, it's it probably is is not shocking. <laughs> Right, uh, but but to I think a lot of a lot of non-native people who are accustomed to thinking of people like Thomas Jefferson as fundamentally having, uh, you know, having having good intentions, um, it's 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 a pretty eye-opening statement. I want to underscore the point too that John's kind of getting at that this U.S. Dakota War in Minnesota wasn't some isolated event that flared All up. Right. It was right. the beginning of kind of a tidal wave that started with Jefferson in 1803 and kind of swept across the country. So you know, it wasn't just in Minnesota that this played out all the way across as the kind of white people settled the country and it's how the country was formed really. Well, I think it's important too when we when we teach about the treaties that we don't just that we don't just teach, you know, this is the land that was ceded, you know, this was the land that was bought and sold, you know, this is this is the amount of money um, to really get into what those treaties were about, what the, the under unjust treaty negotiations in the first place of, of, you know, how some of these treaties were actually not necessarily treaties, considering treaties are supposed to be, be between, you know, two parties that, that actually agree mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than one party that means that's being essentially forced. Um, right. And, and to, to look at how, you know, the amount that was supposed to come out of those treaties, um, how some of those annuities were never paid, how, how the, the, the monetary amounts um, were never made. Um, it's important because if we, treat about, if we teach about these treaties and just teach off the documents themselves, mm -hmm. uh, it leaves a lot of information out. Mm -hmm. You know, what actually happened um, as an effect of those treaties, how much money w was actually paid, how much wasn't paid, you know, how, how many years did it take to get those annuities, mm -hmm. if they came at all, what were the annuities, um, how spoiled were, was the food mm -hmm. that the people yeah. received. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all important things to look at instead of just teaching off of a document which doesn't tell you anything. Right. And when you walk into the governor's reception room just down the block here at the Capitol, there's a big painting of that treaty signing going on you know mm -hmm. so it's kind of our proud masterpiece in minnesota but it's mm -hmm. got certainly an undercurrent of right of I, I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't go back just a little bit in time to describe um the circumstances of the dakota people little crow's people uh before the fighting uh began i mean these were people who were not getting what they were owed by the terms of the treaty how, however they were arrived at were starving people. Food was on hand. Um, 
the, the payments were not being made that would allow them to equip themselves to, to go west and hunt buffalo or bison farther west uh, of Minnesota. Um, I mean, these were people on the brink. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, fighting aside, th the prospects were really grim for them heading into what would prove to be a very tough winter, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you ask any community, um, ask any mother what she's going to do when she sees her child starving. Um, what what father, you know, what, what choices are they going to make when they see their family starving, when they see what's happening to their community and to their parents? And, and, and um, you know, there's tough choices that are made and, and there, there's things that, that play out as a, from the effects of these types of mm -hmm. things that are, that are really important to think about. And, you know, those annuities that, that didn't come, that, that, that were late, um, you know, the, there, there was food in some of the storehouses, but the Indian agent, um, Thomas Gal Galbraith, um, wouldn't hand out those annuities. And then um, after the start of the war, he, he locked himself in one of the stores and was drunk for two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this was the Indian agent who, who should have stepped up and, 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 and could have actually um, done something. Um, and, and, you know, that was the decision that he made. And, you know, there's... There's so many things, you know, when, when you think about what led to the war, um, and that's one of the hard parts about teaching about the war, um, is when you ask students, well, what caused the war? It's, it's not the egg incident in Acton, mm -hmm. you know, that, led, that started the war. You know, that was, that was a match, you know. It, it, it wasn't um, even necessarily just the, the late annuities. You know, it goes back 100 years before that, 200 mm -hmm. years before that, um, to really look at the causes, you know, look at the 1805 treaty, mm -hmm. look at the unjust negotiations of that treaty, and the fact that the land was the hundred thousand acres of land was speculated to be worth two hundred thousand dollars, but the amount was left blank, and mm -hmm. then two thousand dollars was promised later, but only two hundred dollars worth of goods were get given out, which mm -hmm. included sixty gallons of whiskey. You know, how fair is that? Right. You know, right. you look at um, some of these earlier things. Right. And, and John, as you pointed out so poignantly um, at near the end of your piece, uh, the history of no people is is as simple as as we would like it to be, right? Well, I think that's I think that's true, and that was sort of a <clears throat> yeah, an attempt to kind of broaden the story and universalize it, and I think it is probably true everywhere, uh, and it's certainly true in the United States, and um, uh, that. In particular, I think with you know we've come a long way in this country, in in uh, in in our lifetimes, in um, telling the story in a more full way. For example, of what have happened to people of African descent on this continent. Uh, I, I don't think we've begun in anywhere in, in in anything like that kind of way, really, as a broader culture. To to tell ourselves um, a, the a, the truer story of what what happened to Native people, uh, some of the people that I've talked to in um, in in North Carolina, um, you know they, they they know they know about the Civil War and they'll talk about it and and they've had to come face to face with since the Civil Rights Movement with the the story of African Americans in this part of the country, but uh, you know uh, North Carolina has the Cherokee. And other tribes, and uh, that's that's no more in the in the kind of uh, frontal lobe of people uh, in this in this part of the country about you know in telling the story about their place than than uh, than our history is in Minnesota. So we all have uh, l lots of work to do. Right. We have a an online uh, statement or question from Roxanne Gould. Uh, this is for you, Kate. She says, "Ask Kate to talk about reparations. Dakota people want to come home." Hello, Roxanne. Um, <laughs> I know Roxanne. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. We've talked about, you know, there was the 150th anniversary, um, the homecoming that happened in Flandreau um, in August um, that um, both of you have, have documented, um, and it was a very powerful event. Um, and on that day, um, when we walked across the state line together, um, or the day before, I think, um, Dayton had repudiated the, um, the um, Dakota Exclusion Act um, and said, welcome home. And so when we were walking across that border, um, there was a number of people on the sidelines, you know, shaking our hands and welcoming, welcoming us home. Um, and I think that was a very powerful thing. Um, it was very important, you know, and, and 
I was weary at first, but when I saw the looks on those grandmas um, that, that, that led us, and I, and, I, and I saw how important it was for, for so many of those people to come together, you know, for our people to come together like that and have that symbolic moment, um, I understood it was about healing, and, and I think that's really important. Um, at the same time, you know, I think from a political level, um, if you're looking at welcoming us home, back home as Dakota people, um, you really, we, I, I tend to, I, I have to ask the question, you know, what do we have to come home to? Mm -hmm. You know, um, will reparations will be made? Will, will reparations be made? What kind of direct, direct action will follow um, welcoming us back home and inviting us here? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, reparations were made to the white settlers after the war. Mm -hmm. um, we never received those annuities. Mm -hmm. We still never received those payments. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, you know, what kind of actions are, will, will be taken to actually bring us back home? Um, and, and reparations is a scary word. People don't like to talk about it. People don't like to think about it. But the fact is, it doesn't necessarily always have to be money. Mm -hmm. You know, there are plenty of buildings um, in Minneapolis, um, in, in the Twin Cities area, in St. Paul, and, and that um, are empty that could be used for Dakota use. Mm. Um, Roxanne's working on a school right now called Badote, which is a very important school for our community um, to teach our children um, about about ourselves and about our language and 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 to to try and um, to to um, you know we, we have school we have schools that that we that we need to create and we have resource there, there needs to be the resources there um, to help us with these things mm -hmm. um, and because we are a part of this community, mm -hmm. you know, we are we are still here, and, and we we struggle to stay here, and um, you know, so reparations aren't necessarily you know a payoff amount. You know, nobody I don't know who would be happy with any sort of payoff amount. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's something it's something that needs to be discussed. It's something that needs to be talked about, and mm -hmm. and not in a way that's divisive, and not a way not. You know, it doesn't need to be something that tears people apart or that makes people think that um, Dakota people are trying to to get something um, that other people don't have rights to. You know, it's it's it, it it's about taking care of taking care of each other and taking care of the mm -hmm. indigenous people of this land. Mm -hmm. Do you think this year the, the 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 reporting that's being done and the the general discussion that seems to be happening around this anniversary are are, are these meaningful steps any sense about that yeah i think they're very meaningful steps you know I, i'm i'm definitely hearing a lot more about um about this history than when i first moved out here nine years ago you know there are definitely changes to be made and um changes that are that are happening um and and, and that's a really good thing and and this dialogue is important this discussion is important um but it needs to keep going, and that's the whole thing with this whole 150th year sesquicentennial thing um, that's going on in this state. You know, all this emphasis is putting on, being put on the war, and we just don't want it to be turned into a theme. Mm -hmm. You know, and we need to look at what about the 200, 300, thousand years before the war? Mm -hmm. What about the 150 years after the war? Mm -hmm. As Dakota people, our history is much longer than the war. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to teach about all of these things, about this, you know, this this whole time period, and, and teach about us as a people um, and I think it's you know the, it's a discussion that needs to continue into the future um, it's it's like you said it's just a beginning um, to talk about this stuff and, and it, it's late it's late coming for sure um, but it needs to happen mm -hmm. yeah. John well I I, I I agree and I felt like um, that the the note that uh, the piece ends on or nearly ends on of the of the walk home and Gwen um, being moved by um, the governor's gesture and talking about the importance of acknowledgement, uh, I felt like that that you know that's that's a beautiful um, moment, and that, that there, there's this sort of arc that of the story that that comes to that moment. But at the same time, that's that's not the end of the story; it's the beginning. Uh, I agree with Kate about the next. The next conversation that needs to have, especially when if we can get to more of a critical mass of Minnesotans uh, mm -hmm. understanding this story in a fuller way, is well, then what? Then what? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do about? Um, uh, what do we do in response? Uh, and it's you know I'm not going to sit here 
on this, you know, Wednesday afternoon and, and offer an answer. Uh, but that's a conversation that ought, that ought to happen right. over time and involving of, everybody. I'll Kurt, throw out a couple suggestions because I've been asked about on, on similar topics. And as a parent in St. Paul, one of the things I'm proud of is that I sent my kids to a Spanish immersion school. I'm Jewish, and they went to Hebrew school. I think it would be great to see more Dakota immersion language programs. We have mm-hmm. French and German <clears throat> and Japanese. Mm-hmm. I think it would make all the sense in the world to have Dakota immersion schools, for one thing. I've also suggested that Fort Snelling is such an accessible place. And when you go there now, it's basically a celebratory narrative, and you can have your daughter's birthday party with Mrs. Snelling, but why not make that kind of a center, and not just for the Dakota War, because like Kate points out, the Dakota people are more than a war. They have centuries and centuries of culture and history and art and and great things. Why not make Fort Snelling a little bit more accessible and tell the story of the Dakota people, you know, right there where... Uh, sadly, 150 years ago, they were at right now at this time, we're starting to be locked up in a stockade. So I think that would be a good spot to to keep this discussion going. Right. Well, and I think, you know, the discussion about Fort Snelling needs to continue. You know, there's a number of people in in the Dakota community who feels like the fort should be torn down, that, that you know, the fort should not be there in the first place. You know, it stands for, for you know, a horrendous piece in history, a, a horrendous time. And um, it, it and I understand that um, that argument. At the same time, there's a number of empty buildings around that area, around that larger area there um, on both sides of Highway 55 that are sitting empty. We need schools. <laughs> we need resources. Um, we need places to... Um, you know, combine our efforts and work towards language revitalization. And, and, and you know, we need um, Heritage Center and, and, and places to, you know, to, to be able to do these things and the resources to be able to do these things. Right. I, I was going to ask you all uh, if there was anything left to discover about this story, but it sounds like the discovery is, is looking ahead now, perhaps, and not looking back so much towards uh, the, the more dramatic moments of the fighting and, 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 and so forth. But it's really the discovery part now is what we can find within ourselves to take what we've learned through the journalism and, and storytelling and knowledge of the Dakota people and what we make of it, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, um, history is a story. You know, and there are so many different perspectives about it. You know, I can sit up here and, and, and speak on behalf of myself, but I in no way speak on behalf of all Dakota people. You know, we have a multiplicity of perspectives out there. Um, and, you know, history and truth telling, these are really important things um, to talk about. Um, and the fact that there are multiple perspectives on all of this um, shows that just how important it, ha- it is to have a, a, a larger dialogue and, and even more discussion to inclu- include all of these perspectives. Mm-hmm. John, I think uh, your reporting probably is a, a good trigger for some of that discussion. Thank you for your work. Thank you, and thanks to NPR for, <laughs> for working with me on it and presenting it. Um, uh, you know, the whole thing has been an amazing privilege, and, um, <clears throat> and I agree with your point, Mike, that it um, for all of the the, the pain and the <clears throat> disturbing aspects of it, that um, the experience of immersing myself in this story for the better part of a year has vastly enriched my understanding uh, <clears throat> of the place I grew up in, and uh, I'll never see the Minnesota River Valley uh, in quite the same way again. And I think that's a I think that's a good thing. Um, so I hope that uh, yeah we can all kind of move forward and continue this conversation. And Kurt, thanks uh, thanks to you for your story, really opening for many of us, uh, opening our eyes to this central figure uh, in the story of not just the Dakota people, but of the state itself. Well, you know, for a newspaper guy like me, Mike, to get four months pretty much nonstop to cover one story is kind of unheard of. It's a great luxury, but in in many ways, we really just scratched the surface. Some people have spent their whole life studying this conflict and what led up to it, and there's certainly a lot more to tell. And, you know, I, and I think one of the misconceptions people have is that all the Dakota people went to war against the whites when really it was just a few hundred people, and a lot of the Dakota people didn't want to go to war, didn't think fighting was the right idea at all. So... I think we also, by focusing on Sibley and Little Crow, we overlooked the Dakota women and all the contributions that the res- resiliency of Dakota women, those first few winters after after this conflict happened, 
and, and, and their stories, I think, need to be told more. So there's a lot more work to do. And Kate, thanks to you for sharing your, your knowledge, your expertise, and uh, the Dakota perspective in our conversation. Mm, thanks for having me. You know, I really enjoyed both John and Kurt's pieces. Um, I thought it was really important to get um, those Dakota voices heard out there in the media. We're, we're not often seen in the media, and, and it's a new thing to, to have us out there and to have our voices be heard, you know, and to talk about the stories of, you know, Gwen Westerman and Melvin Lee Houston and Ramona Kiddo Stately and all these great people in our community to give them a chance to, to talk about their lives was, was wonderful. Good. Kate Bean is Flandreau Santee Dakota and a PhD in American Studies at the University of Minnesota. She's a graduate instructor and is a teacher of Dakota culture and history. Kurt Brown is a writer for the Minneapolis Star Tribune and John Gordon, uh, John Gordon, John Bewin is the audio director at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. Thanks to you all for joining us and this conversation will live on online at mprnews.org. <laughs>